Alright, hello, good evening everyone, and welcome to the Copernic Observatory YouTube channel. Uh, so tonight we have a program, uh, a Night Sky Live program for you called Mars Meets the Green Comet. And uh, on February 1st, we covered the Green Comet 
uh, also known as Comet uh, C2022E3ZTF. And we did a live stream on that. And it was during, uh, well, it was getting close to full moon around that time. So the moon gave off a lot of sky glow. It wasn't ideal conditions for observing it, even though we had clear skies here. Now, uh, while the comet is now drifting away from the Earth, um, moving further away, the February 1st stream was close approach, it's still bright enough to capture in a live feed and uh, still capture good images from it and possibly even better images given uh, that the conditions are a lot better. So uh, that's what we're going to uh, focus on trying to get tonight. That's one of the things. Uh, we'll try and get the a better image of the green comet. Uh, I, I have this stream set up where it's not just a uh, live view. It's also going to be an imaging session. So uh, I'll be able to preview those images for you uh, as we go throughout the stream tonight. Um, so we can, they won't be processed, but they, they will give you an idea um, of what, we're, what we have to work with. So uh, as always, uh, I, for anyone new to the channel tonight, um, usually we do pick up some new viewers um, on, our, on our observing live streams and others. So I want to uh, take a moment to explain who we are at Copernic, where we're located and, and so on. So that if you ever have the chance to visit us here or if you stick with us on the YouTube channel, um, you'll, you'll know what we're about. So let me switch us over to this view here so that you can see the big screen. Okay, so here we are, Copernic Observatory and Science Center. This is our website, copernic.org. You can uh, visit uh, this site uh, at the link in the video description um, along with our other social media channels. Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, there, so there's lots of ways to interact with us and of course we're here on YouTube. So, uh, here we'll post all of our upcoming events, including um, our live streams. So, here's our NSL. We have three virtual programs that you can watch. We have NSLs, which are Night Sky Live programs. We have um, FNLs, which are Friday Night Live streams. Um, so, those will uh, kick up again. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick those back up in uh, mid-March. They'll be uh, happening uh, every Friday. Uh, we do wind down a little bit in the winter time because it gets pretty cold up here, pretty snowy. Uh, so uh, we don't fully shut down. And of course, we have virtual programs like this. Uh, but those Friday night live streams will pick up every Friday uh, pretty soon here as we head into March. Uh, as we scroll down here, you'll also see our winter star party. Let's click on this one. Learn more about the winter star party, which is an in-person event. And we will have a virtual component to it as well for our YouTube viewers. So uh, this is happening February 18th at 7 p.m. And it's to celebrate our namesake. Uh, we get our name from the Polish pronunciation, the Polish spelling of Mikolaj Kopernik or Nicholas Copernicus. And uh, this year we're celebrating his 550th birthday. Uh, he was born in 1473, specifically February 19th. Uh, so we always hold this star party on Saturdays, so we're a day off in this case, but sometimes we, we align. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to have some uh, a couple of presentations, uh, which we have started to uh, promote on our social media channels. And uh, there'll be some family-friendly activities, and if it's clear out, we'll be doing some uh, observing through our telescopes. Doors open at 6.30. All right, so uh, some of the things you'll be able to see, by the way, um, you'll see the Orion Nebula, uh, Jupiter and Venus are out. I just saw uh, Venus setting um, as I was setting up my telescope tonight. So uh, there's a couple of plans. Mars will be out too. Um, that's, of course, our focus for tonight. So uh, that's a, a great in-person and virtual event that you can uh, join us for. Okay, how about we scroll down to the bottom of the page and we can access our clear sky chart to see what the conditions in the night sky are going to be like tonight. And here we are. So, uh, let's see. The uh, cloud cover here uh, is looking pretty good. Um, actually, even at least one of the models is predicting 
it should stay clear even after midnight. The other model set is, says it'll get cloudy as midnight approaches. So we'll see which one of those is true. Transparency is looking good, and uh, which is generally a good sign for dim and diffuse objects like the comet and deep sky objects. The seeing is average, um, and that's great for planetary objects. So uh, if we wanted to do any captures of Mars, it's not the best night for it, but about as good as you can get on average around our area. So looking good for tonight up at Copernic. By the way, for those that haven't visited us, this is our site. Uh, we're a science center here and an observatory back here. So we have a, a few domes. We have the uh, six inch uh, refractor telescope, um, which is currently um, out for maintenance, but uh, it will be back. And uh, that we wanna, that's one, a very unique telescope. So we, we're keeping that one around for sure. Uh, then we have the 14 inch reflector telescope here. That's a Celestron Edge HD. And in the back we have our flagship 20 inch reflector and that's a Rishi Kreishan telescope. And of course, look at this over here, we have our science park, uh, which uh, of course not really open much, um, but uh, at least during the winter time, uh, it gets pretty snowy up here, like I said, but uh, as we get into the warmer months coming up here, uh, that uh, will be very active again, I expect. And let's see, let's go in here. One last thing. This is under our public programs and upcoming Friday night events. Uh, you can, again, access a full list of our planned events in the future. And, okay, here we go. We have our uh, present presentations from Professor, uh, I, I hope I can pronounce the name correctly, Alex Wolskan? Wolskan? <laughs> Uh, that's my, my best attempt. I apologize. Um, from Penn State, um, who will talk about exoplanet research. Uh, by the way, if you're attending in person, we will be celebrating uh, Nikolai Copernic's birthday with cupcakes. So uh, we'll, we'll be celebrating there. And then we will also have uh, a presentation from Southern Tier native Gary O'Neill. Um, he's an engineer who works at the Kennedy Space Flight Center and will give us an update on the Gateway and Artemis missions, uh, which are the uh, missions, Artemis is the mission that will return astronauts for the back to the moon for the first time since 1972. So a uh, couple of neat updates about exoplanet research and Artemis there for you during Winter Star Party next week. So if you can attend, uh, doors open 6.30, February 18th. All right, next thing, last thing of uh, promotions here. We'll get to the comet in Mars, I promise. That'll, that's the focus of tonight, so stick with us. Um, now, this is uh, our YouTube channel. Um, if you're new, this is maybe where you found us. And uh, we stream all kinds of uh, content here. Uh, like I said, we have our Friday night live streams that focus on a variety of STEM topics. The Winter Star Party presentations will kind of fit into that. Uh I might have to call them something different, though. We'll just call it Winter Star Party. Um, then the uh, Night Sky Live programs are our observing events. So that's what you're watching right now. And then we have one more, um, which is our Copernic reactions. Let's see, do I have one of those up here? Maybe in our live. Let's go here to our live tab. And you can see I label each type of program with its acronym. So Night Sky Live, FNL. Friday night live stream. And then here's our next one. This is Copernic reactions. So KRXN. If you're into chemistry, you might know RXN is short for reaction. And uh, our KRXNs are exactly what they sound like. We react to a big event in space exploration. Um, and in this case, it was uh, the Artemis about two months ago, we watched Artemis 1 launch to the moon. So uh, we like to share in those big events with you and kind of build a community around those events that we, so we can chat about it. You can ask questions and uh, we can answer and it's a, it's a good conversation. Um, good place to do a sort of watch party on those events. So if you enjoy uh, the idea behind those types of programs and you enjoy tonight's content, then uh, subscribe to the channel, like the video too, that shows your support. Um, 
And we do have two ways to donate to Copernic as well in our live streams. You can either donate right through the chat um, and you can just click that heart shaped icon in the live chat and that's one way to donate. You can do so anonymously or you can share your name either way. And then the other option, let's see what something's going on here with, oh no, that looks okay. Looked a little weird to me, sorry. Um, so, and then you have uh, the PayPal link in this video's description. If you prefer to go through PayPal, that's another method to support us. Uh, so, uh, and we thank you for any contribution or support you can provide. Uh, Copernic sticks around through the kindness of uh, our community. Uh, so we thank you for liking the video, subscribing, and uh, if you're in a position to do so, any donation you can provide. All right, so let's jump. That's our YouTube channel. And I want to go to, let's bring this up here. Well, let's bring the website up first. Uh, one of the tools that we'll be using tonight um, for our regular viewers, you're very familiar with this, is Stellarium. We'll be bouncing to Stellarium to kind of show you where these objects are in the sky, where you can find them. Um, and that'll be a good tool for you to use at home. You can download it for Linux, Mac OS, Windows. There's a web-based version if you have a Chromebook. It even works on a smartphone. There is an app that you can download in the uh, App Store or the Google Play Store for Android or iOS. So uh, just search for this here, Stellarium, S-T-L-L-A-R-I-U-M, and that will get you to uh, the website to download. All right, uh, so this tool is your at-home planetarium. So if you've been to a planetarium before, you know it's a way to simulate the, the sky, day or night. And it's also a time machine. You can travel through time to see events in the future or the past. And... <laughs> Uh, in this case, I'll bring it up here. It was actually what we were using for our pre-show. So here it is. You can see it's still cycling. Um, I'm going to return it back to real time, present day. And I'm going to turn the atmosphere back on because we had that turned off. Um, so there we go. There's a bunch of tools on the toolbar. You can turn the constellations on and off and their labels as well. You can add some artwork looking into the mythology of these objects, okay? And one thing I did not do on the previous Comet stream is uh, show you how to access uh, the Comet. Um, if you downloaded this and you went uh, during that stream and you went searching for Comet C 2022 E3 ZTF, you probably would not have found it because it's something you have to add to Stellarium. You have to populate it into the system so I'm going to show you how to do that now for anyone that was curious about that on the last stream. So first thing you're going to do is you're going to go into the configuration window. Okay, so click that wrench. And I believe it's under plugins. Let's see. Kind of have to, oh, solar system editor. Okay, yep. So plugins on the configuration window and then solar system editor. Okay, and you're gonna go click configure. And let's see if it's in this list first. C2022, okay, it is there on mine, but that's because it was probably added already. So let's see if we can import here. Okay, so let's go back to that. You're on this page now that says minor solar system objects. And we can go to import orbital elements. We can click, as, uh, sorry, uh, the comets. <laughs> um, and then MPC's list of observable comets and get orbital elements. And then you can just search through this list of comets that are out there. And I'm guessing that mine's probably not going to show up. Let's see. Because I think I've already added it, so it might not show up in here. I see C22E2, but I don't see 
yeah, I don't see the, the, the one I have because it, it's already in my system. So that's the way that you can add ob cometary objects. You can even add, add asteroids that aren't in there. Um, but that's the tools that you use to go through and add those to the system. So it's under plugins, solar system editor, configure, and you can start adding and importing orbital elements from there. So that's how you get Comet ZTF into your Stellarium. And now when I go to the search window, I can search C2022, oops, might be case dependent, C2022, and it's going to pop right up. You can click on it, it will target the comet, and you can zoom on in. Okay, and you can see just how close the, the comet is to Mars tonight. Sort of a conjunction of, of sorts. But I see we got a, a $20 donation uh, from someone. Thank you so much uh, for your support. All right, so, uh, and by the way, I do, an important part of our live streams is to go through and answer questions that you have in the chat. So I will be sure to uh, initiate that Q&A session. Uh, I'll open it up to you. Uh, so uh, if you have a question for me specifically, we do have moderators in the cha chat that are helping to answer as well. But if you have an a question for me, um, just hold on to that until we get to the Q&A session. All right, so finding the comet isn't going to really do you much good visually. Um, in fact, why don't we jump to my little slideshow here. Uh, da, 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 there we go. So, because I'm going to explain a few things about this comet. All right, so it's Comet C2022E3ZTF. And if you watched the previous stream, we're just going to review this because all this content is in the last stream if you wanted to go through and, and talk about it and, and hear what, what I had to say about it last time. But that's what each component of the name means. C means non-periodic. It's on a very long orbit. In fact, now it's on, a, on its way out of the solar system. 2022 is its year of discovery. E3, this is how we narrow down where, when it was discovered a little more in that 2020, year of 2022. So this means it's the third comet, that's where the three comes from, discovered in the fifth half month. So it was discovered in the first half of March. And then ZTF is where it was, uh, what it was discovered by, what system it was discovered by and where it was discovered which was by the Zwicky Transient Facility at um, uh, the Palomar Observatory in California. All right, and we can go into a little bit about what comets are as well. Um, but some figures, uh, some information about it. We have a 50,000 year orbital period, but now it's probably reached uh, escape velocity and it's going to venture out into the solar system, uh, venture out of it into interstellar space. It's a comet from the Oort cloud, which is a grouping of very icy objects, um, big diffuse cloud around at the very edges of our solar system. And then the uh, current magnitude isn't quite right. Now we're, we're past magnitude six. And here is how we measure magnitude uh, in, in astronomy. So uh, don't mind this. This was from our ABCs of stargazing. This is the B, which is for brightness or magnitude. And this is our scale. So from very bright on the left to very faint on the right, notice it goes from negative to positive. A little bit counterintuitive to how you might think about it, but that's how it's measured. So the sun is way over here at like negative 30. Here's the moon. Venus, Vega, the star Vega is at zero. And the faintest object that you will see with your eye is around positive six. So, and of course, this is very dependent on the conditions in your sky too. If you have a lot of light pollution, that it's going to be way down, uh, way over here near Vega or even beyond. So you might only be able to see uh, the brightest planets in certain 
conditions if your light pollution is poor um, or it's cloudy, things like that. But in the ideal conditions, your eye will pick up about a positive six magnitude. That's the faintest object that you can see. And guess where the comet is? It's now past that. So you really won't be seeing it with your eye. Parabinoculars, a telescope, yes, but not so much with your eye. You need to enhance your vision using a, a tool or an instrument like a telescope or binoculars. So that's uh, not something really, I will say, not really worth doing too much tonight, um, especially if your skies are poor. But if you have binoculars or a telescope, I say go for it. See if you can find it. Um, and by the way, this image that we had here of Comet ZTF uh, is, I want to give credit to Dan Bartlett. This is one of the ast astronomy pictures of the day. So the APODs. And uh, that's something that NASA puts out. So you can go uh, check out this image in the APOD history. <clears throat> so a uh, really nice image here where you see the uh, coma around the nucleus of the comet, that bright center there. The coma is green. You have the fanned out dust tail and you have the ion tail. And we can talk more about this as we go through the stream. And I'm sure you'll have questions about it too. But that's an overview of the comet there. And if we go back into Stellarium, what's nice about finding it tonight is it's right near Mars. And it's uh, on the right horn there of Taurus the Bull. So Taurus the Bull is pretty easy to find. You can usually find this V, which is nice and bright. And so you'll want to keep tracing that V towards Mars. And if you look here, it'll be just below Mars. And that's where you want to aim your binoculars. And your binoculars should be wide field enough that you can see Mars and uh, the comet in the same field of view. And that's what we're going to try to do tonight with our camera. I might have to play with field rotation a bit, but I'm going to do my best to capture both Venus and, not Venus, excuse me, Mars and the comet together. All right. Uh, so that's, uh, that's looking good. Now, without further ado, I do want to uh, show you what we have for the comet so far and I'm talk about how we're imaging it, what tools we're using, and so forth. But let's get it up on the screen here our live view of the comet. Okay, so there it is. And it's not too far off from what we were viewing on February 1st, um, when the comet was the closest to the Earth. So the brightness hasn't changed too much. It is just now verging towards that, uh, where it gets too faint for our sight. Uh, the camera's doing a good job picking it up. And of course, I have it hooked up to a telescope as well. Now, one thing we are going to be able to do more of tonight is do some better imaging of it. I was very strictly focused on live streaming last time. This time I'm going to be focused on imaging. So we're going to be getting a little bit more technical here, um, but I think it'll be, it'll be worth it. Um, as we, you'll, you'll, it'll be a good learning experience too for anyone that's new to imaging. Um, so let's uh, show you what, how I'm going to do this. So we're going to have our, we'll be showing our live view on occasion here. And I notice I do not have Mars in this field of view yet. Like I said, I'm going to have to play with uh, the, the field, the field of view. Um, most likely what I'll have to do is get the comet close to the edge. It'll be somewhere on the edge of this box. And uh, Mars will also be somewhere on an edge. Um, because they're they're still they're far enough away that in a telescope's field of view, um, it's it, it's not quite going to fit um, in the center. Um, but we'll we'll try and capture them both. It's and get a good image from that. All right. So uh, why don't we just take a picture? Um, you should be able to read my camera settings. Um, I have that off to the right hand side here. So. To start, we're going to snap a photo of, uh, it's notice I'm on manual mode, so I'm going to control the shutter speed. We're going to do a 30 second exposure, meaning the sensor is going to be open. The shutter will be open for 30 seconds. Light will hit that sensor 
light coming through the telescope will hit that sensor over that 30 second period. The camera collects all that information and it will compose an image. My ISO, uh, which is the sensitivity of the camera's sensor, um, it's light sensitivity, is 8,000. Um, the higher you go in ISO, the more noisy the image can becomes, but the more sensitive it is to light. So uh, we can play with that setting a little bit as well. I might also play with the focus on the telescope. The focus isn't on the camera. The camera, you're trying to achieve prime focus on the scope as it's affixed to it. And um, maybe I can try to think how I do that. I might be able to show you my rig outside, but I'll have to think about how I want to go about it. Um, it might just be going out, taking a picture and bringing it back and showing you. <laughs> um, that's my initial thought, but we'll see what we can do. All right, so this is a remote, this is remote camera software. My camera is a Sony camera. Um, this is their uh, imaging edge software. So I'm on the remote tool. There's also a viewer that you can use. Um, and you can see I have control over the shutter right here. So let's just snap a photo. We'll wait 30 seconds and get an image back. Okay, my tracking seems to be doing pretty well. So we might even be able to go up to a minute. We'll see what we can grab. So uh, yeah, what's, uh, one of the, there's a couple limiting factors here when you're taking a long exposure image, especially of a comet. One is how good my tracking is on my telescope mount um, because the sky appears to move as the night goes on, right? The stars in the sky appear to move and it's all driven by the Earth's rotation. Um, but there's another thing going on here. The comet, ooh, interesting. I wonder what that line is. I keep getting that line popping up. that be? Sorry, I got distracted, but is it in the same place each time? Yeah. Hmm. I'm going to have to look into that. It might be something with my rig. I'm not sure. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, anyways, uh, we'll see. We'll we'll try moving the scope around a bit and maybe get rid of that artifact. It's something I could totally process out. That's not a big deal, but uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm I'm talking about that weird artifact too much. Let's talk about the comet. Um, so let's expand this here. All right. So this is a photo I just took a minute ago, right? I took that 30 second exposure and, uh, we can see the green color. Now, when we look at the live view, that green color, this is the comet right here, that green color might just pop into view here or there but it's very dull in our live camera view, um, if it's there at all. Um, notice sort of this noise all throughout the image. It's kind of like RGB noise. You can see uh, dim or dull red, green, and blue colors, maybe a bit of yellow in there too. Um, so that might be just your mind playing a trick on you if you're seeing green, or it could be actual green from the comet, hard to say. But you can see the nucleus and maybe a hint of the coma, maybe a touch of the dust tail. But when we take a long exposure image, we let the camera do a lot of work, pull in all of that information coming from the comet, that is what you get over 30 seconds at that, uh, shut, at the, that shutter speed and at that... Um, sensitivity, that ISO. So that was at 8,000. And you can see some evidence for the noise that you get at that sensitivity as you scale it up. Now, what we're going to be searching for here with uh, our comet images are all the components that make up a comet. 
in the sky. So we have the green, right? There's the green color um, that some comets have and why this comet is called the green comet. Um, there are a lot of comets that have that green coma. Neowise had a green coma. In fact, the image in the thumbnail of this video is Comet Neowise from July of 2020. Um, so a lot of comets have that. And the reason it's green is because... Uh, can I expand this? Oh, here's full screen. No, I guess I can't do full screen. Hang on. Because some of this information here I don't really need. But if not, that's okay. We'll just keep it zoomed in. Hmm. All right, so uh, yeah, that green color is coming from uh, gaseous diatomic carbon. So uh, think about our, you know, carbon you might find, you know, graphite is an example of carbon. Um, and in, in this case where we find it on Earth, we'll find it um, in that solid form. Uh, organic molecules are molecules composed of carbon. Um, carbon is a, a, a big, comp uh, is the driving force behind those organic molecules, right? That's why we call them organic molecules. It's because they're molecules with carbon. And um, of course, carbon is a, a fundamental component for the formation of life. Um, we're composed of those organic molecules. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you also find carbon in carbon dioxide, or CO2. So there's solid carbon dioxide on a comet in that nucleus. This is, a comet is basically a dirty snowball. And some of that carbon on a comet is diatomic carbon, which is two carbon atoms bonded together. And uh, when it's in its gaseous phase and it's being energized by the solar wind in this case, it will emit light. So this gaseous diatomic carbon is effectively being electrified, kind of like the gas in a fluorescent bulb, which is above me here in the space science lab. So uh, that's what we're, what we're seeing there, is that glow from the carbon, from the diatomic carbon. And then as you look further out, you get this fanned out dust tail. Okay, and the dust tail is exactly what it sounds like. It's dustier material coming off of the comet. Um, and it's being blown off the comet via the solar wind. That solar energy hitting the comet, it blows it off, um, blows material off, and the comet will leave some of it behind as it travels through, base, through space. Some of it will follow in its orbit. Um, but that's what we're seeing. And the dust tail will point away from the sun. Okay. And then the last thing we're going to try and find, and we saw it in the other images, is the ion tail. Now, maybe, maybe there is a hint of an ion tail right here. And I'm not sure even how well that will come across over the stream. But we're going to do our best to try and pull out the ion tail. And the ion tail is, again... It's a good name for it. Um, it's uh, ions, energized ions coming off of the comet. You'll have your car uh, carbon and oxygen ions. So the carbon dioxide and the carbon monoxide will uh, be ionized by the solar wind, and those ions will be energized and emit light. So again, the ion tail is a glow. The coma, the green coma, is a glow coming from the comet itself. The material is emitting light. The dust tail is strictly reflectance. So all of that light coming from this fanned out dust tail is just from reflected light. Um, sun, reflected sunlight, right? Okay. So uh, let's play around with the imaging settings here. Uh, why don't we just try a 60 second exposure? Because like I said, we're going to be limited on both my telescope's tracking and the uh, comet actually moving through space. And we might actually see that shift play out uh, at 60 seconds or if we were go to be, go be, if we were to go beyond that. 
So let me set a timer on my watch here for one minute. We'll click the shutter, hit one minute, and we'll do a 60 second exposure. Oh, I gotta hold it, that's right. Uh, let's see, what can, we, can we do this? Oh, and just like that, I lost the, uh, one thing I wish they would add are my uh, customized settings to this because we lost the live view on the camera. But that's okay. Um, well, I'll, go, I'll have to go out there and manually hit the button that will turn up all the sensitivity settings so that we can get a live view of the comet. that timer right now. Capture interval, one minute. Bear with me, it's been a minute since I've, I've done this. It's been a while since we've run an imaging stream. That's just gonna be the interval between shots. I need my... Let's see what we got. Nope, not coming through. I prefer not to hold down the uh, shutter button. So I'm, I'm going to find my intervalometer so that I can set the bulb setting. I know I've seen it in here before. It's easier to do on my uh, my iPad. And that's usually what I'm using out in the field. I'm not often hooked up to a, a PC. Well, let's just do, let's just hold it down for 60 seconds just to start here and I'll work on finding that setting. Okay, so we're gonna take a 60 second exposure now. Alright, 30 seconds to go. And we'll see just how the tracking is on my scope. We're looking for star trails from that. And if the comet's moving fast enough, we're looking for the, the comet itself to be leaving behind its own trail as it moves through the solar system. I should show you where the comet is as well in our solar system. I have a nice uh, website to go for that. Alright, there's our 60 second image. That artifact is still there. I do, I'm so curious as to what that is. If anyone from the, uh, or anyone in general, but um, if anyone too from the KAS has seen something like that, let me know. I mean, it's been sticking around for so long. It has to be an artifact in my scope or my camera, I suppose, but, or some glare off of something. Like, what else would that be? It doesn't look like it's... It's just always in the image, and if it was a satellite, it would have moved on already. If it was a, a contrail from an airplane, it probably would have dissipated already. Because um, I took these as test images way early, and it's still there. So I'm not sure what that's about. Uh, let's see, information. 
That was a 58 second exposure. Cut it off a little bit early, but that's all right. Yeah, not quite picking up, and we might not pick up the ion tail. The conditions might not be quite right for that, but, um, or the comet is already venturing out too much. The ion tail has become very dim. But yeah, that's that's pretty good. Much better than our image from the previous streams. It looks like we're we have pretty good tracking on the stars. You can see a little bit of shifting here. But nothing too bad. Compare it to our 30 second image. Again, I feel like there's a slight, maybe a slight sense of that ion tail in this one. So maybe we should go back and to 30 seconds and play with those settings a little. Okay, and by the way, when the, um, when the camera is taking the picture, we don't get a live view at all. So keep that in mind when we're taking an image, taking a frame, we're not going to be seeing a live view because the, cam the camera and the sensor is occupied taking the image over those 30 seconds in this case. So let's play with the ISO. By the way, on this camera, you can just keep cranking that uh, ISO up. I'm gonna bring my camera down just a bit. There we go. <clears throat> so I'm more in frame. So you can, you can just keep going. Now this is absurd for what we're doing, but you can keep pushing it if you wanted to. I think that's its limit. Nope, keeps going. Okay, and then it goes to auto. So it can, you can really crank this camera up to a absurd level, but we're gonna try and go a little bit higher than that 8,000 we had before. That will increase the noise, but just out of curiosity, let's see what we get over these 30 seconds. Again, the live view will not be useful in this case, so I'll just bring up the image of the comet. <laughs> There's our last frame. Uh, when the next frame comes in, it will automatically pop up. So you'll be able, we, we can do a direct comparison between the two. All right, so you can see, actually, that's pretty interesting, right? Um, so you can see this is the 60 second frame here. And this is the 30 second frame at a higher ISO. Notice the change in noise level. I mean, it might be a little bit hard. I can see it on my screen. It might be a little bit hard on your screen coming over the stream. Uh, I mean, YouTube will compress this video a lot um, as it streams out to you. So I can even zoom in a little more to make that more obvious. Can you see this texture? So this is the 30 second. Oh, no, sorry. This one is the 60 second at uh, the 8000 ISO. This one is the 30 second at, what were we? 16 thousand ISO. So you see how that texture changes? So that's the noise in there. But when you zoom out, the pictures aren't too different from each other. Now one thing you might also notice is if we look at the stars specifically between the two images, okay? Actually, no, I, there's about the same star shape to that, which makes me think it's a vibration issue, not a trailing issue. My tracking might, might be okay at 60 seconds, 
But um, I believe the problem with that, yeah, I think the problem with going six, I, I, I have to have the shutter on the camera to activate the bulb setting. Um, and so the, sh the shutter is a mechanical system, right? It actually shuts in front of the sensor. Um, and uh, that can induce some vibrations. Um, ideally, it's not supposed to, uh, but it, it, it might. Um, there might be a delay setting I need to set in that. But the star shape is pretty much the same between a 30 second and a 60 second. So my thinking is that it is a vibration induced star shape. Yeah, they're, they're pretty much the same. So I'll have to see what I can do about that. Um, maybe it's a collimation issue too. But they all take on that shape. But zoomed out, you can see they're, they look very similar, but this was a 30 second shot and this was a 60 second shot. Very similar brightness though to the image. So I preferred this one here because these ones, you can see, I mean, maybe we could tone this down a bit and pull out more detail in the tail of the comet um, after processing, but just as a single frame, I really like this 30 second at, uh, yeah, the 30 second at 8,000 ISO. So I think I'm gonna return it to that 30 second shot and see what I can pull from that. Another option with these is to do some stacking. If we take enough sh quick 30 second shots in succession without the, the comet moving across the star field too much. That's another opportunity. So I'm gonna return this down to 8,000 and let's take another shot at 8,000 ISO with a 30 second image. I'm gonna check my chat here as well. All right, I'm just glancing at the chat here. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention too, um, while this image is being taken, um, if you didn't have the chance to see it yet, on our YouTube channel under our shorts tab, this is best viewed on a smartphone, uh, I put together a time lapse of the video that we got during this stream here from February 1st of the comet. Okay, so you can go to this stream and uh, watch that yourself, um, or you can get the quick time lapse here for Comet ZTF flying by the Earth. Um, and that's that. That's just a kind of a fancy name. That's sort of what what happened. Um, but I'm going to show you the orbital path of the comet in just a moment. Um, but uh, this is going to be <clears throat> showing you how the comet moves against the star field. So worth worth checking out there. It's very quick, like, I don't know, like 10 second video, something like that. And you just see the comet moving across the star field. We probably won't be able to capture a video like that during this stream because, again, we're, we're focused on capturing frames. That stream was more focused on the, the video feed. Here's the path of the comet, by the way. Uh, is this now? So let's set it for now. It should be now. So here's the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Comet, and Mars. And what's cool about this is the Comet is almost, it's very close. It's almost halfway in between the Earth and Mars right now. But you see it's at no risk to impacting either object. What's interesting about its positioning right now is on February 1st, the comet was up here above the Earth. So we were looking at it from above. Now it's in the plane of our solar system. 
So right now the comet is in the ecliptic. The, the ecliptic represents the plane of our solar system. I can actually bring it up here in Stellarium. I gotta turn it on. Ecliptic. Oops, that one. So that red line in Stellarium here represents the plane of our solar system. So here's Jupiter, here's Mars. Venus was also along this line. When the moon rises later, it will be along the ecliptic. Um, and if you look at that orbital field of the solar system, notice how all the main objects, all the main planets, all those lines there are the orbital paths of each planet. They all fall within a plane. Some of them come at a slight angle, but uh, it's very small if that's the case. So in general, the solar system formed as a plane with the main planets along it. Things like Kuiper Belt objects or comets, they have orbital paths that are skewed. They are at sharp angles. Pluto is a good example of that. Do they show Pluto here? No, they do not. Only up to Neptune there. So Neptune's going to be in line with it, but Pluto comes in at an angle to our orb orbital plane. Comets do as well. So look at this arc here from the comet. Comets have very large ecliptic paths. The last time this comet came through the solar system was about 50,000 years ago. And uh, because uh, its orbit was perturbed um, by Jupiter's gravity, that means that it's probably on its way out now. Um, it's going to venture out of the solar system into interstellar space. Okay, so it just so happens tonight, whereas the comet was here on February 1st, we can go back to that date. Uh, it's February 5th. Oh, too far. There's February 1st. So you can see it was above the Earth here. Go back to current time. Now it's in the plane of the solar system. But it's going to quickly exit that plane. You can see in just a week, there it is below the plane week more. It's just going to keep following that path till it's way below the plane. Okay, so we're, at, we're viewing it at, a, at a good time, and this is why it is going to appear so close to Mars, because it has entered that plane. So talking about this in 3D space as we observe that 2D image in the sky, or what appears to be a 2D image, right? So, uh, good. Let's take a look at that frame we got. Yeah, that weird line is still there, but that's all right. So, yeah, I don't know if I'm really... From our previous image here, let's see if we... This was our previous 30-second shot. And yeah, there's definitely a hint of something there, whereas in this one... Maybe not so much. Hmm. But we'll, we'll take a few more like that. Okay, we're doing another 30 second at 8,000 ISO. Um, for those of you wondering what my equipment, uh, what equipment I'm using tonight, I am on a, my camera, my Sony a7 III camera is at prime focus, meaning it's just attached to where you'd put an eyepiece. And I focused the telescope so that I can see a nice clear view in the camera. Here's the next shot that we just got. And... Yeah, see, we're still getting that vibration in the stars, that wiggle. I might go out, since we're taking 30-second exposures, I might go out and turn on silent shooting, which will not move that shutter, and see if that takes care of it. If not, it's something optical. Because um, it's not that's not a sign of star trailing. Because we saw that in both the 60 and the 30, and if it was trailing, we'd see a longer trail in the 60-second shot. Um, where was I going? 
Oh, my equipment. So it's a Sony a7 III camera hooked onto the scope. I focused the image in the camera uh, with the scope's focuser. And uh, the scope itself I'm using tonight is a uh, eight inch, my, it's my personal eight inch telescope. It's an eight inch Newtonian on F5 if you're uh, interested in the focal ratio. So it's a pretty uh, reasonably fast telescope verging on, you know, astrograph levels, which usually are around F4. Um, so pretty fast Newtonian. Um, and when I say fast, that means it's how, how long does it take light to travel through that telescope? Um, and so the, uh, if you have an F5, that's a shorter focal ratio. It's going to be fast. Um, F4 is faster, F3 and so on. It's, it's all related to aperture on the scope. Um, and what else about that? Uh, Eight-inch Newtonian. It's on a Celestron AVX mount, um, so that's the equi an equatorial mount from Celestron uh, that can. Uh, this scope is probably just pushing it on that mount, especially with some camera gear on it. But it does a pretty good job at tracking. Um, so I've been I've been happy with it using it to, so far. You can see the results we're getting tonight. Um, but we're going to do our best to try and improve these images too. And I also want to turn live view back on on the camera so that we can also get some live video of, of the comet itself. We were seeing that earlier in the stream too. <clears throat> uh, what else do I want to talk about here? Oh, I just caught a message, uh, a question from Lou asking, where is Mars in your images? And that's another thing we have to do. Mars is not here yet. Um, so Lou, by the way, is, uh, among many of our uh, astronomy club members, our Astro Society members here at Copernic, um, he, he is, uh, among one of them and he's taught me a lot over the years. Um, so, uh, yeah, Lou, we're going to try and get the, uh, uh, Mars in the field of view and it, based on, you know, what I was, uh, when I was trying to figure this out, if I'd be able to do it with my rig. I believe I can get both of them on the edge of the frame, but I'm going to have to play with the field rotation a bit and uh, try and find it. So maybe maybe we should do that next because this is supposed to be a Mars and Green Comet stream, isn't it? So we got to try and get both of them in the field of view. So I'm going to go out there and get the... Uh, I'll, I'll adjust some of my camera settings. I'm going to try and find Mars and get it in the same view as the comet. And uh, what's the last thing? I think those are the two big things. <laughs> so we'll, we'll uh, I'll spend some time out there and uh, I will get back to you. Oh, I got to turn the live view on the camera. That's the other thing. And then maybe it's once we get Mars in there, we will uh, do a Q&A session. We'll open it up to some questions. So don't post them just yet in the chat if you have questions for me. Um, but if you have a question for a moderator, like our one of our moderators is Astronomy Web, um, another member from our Astro Society here at Copernic, uh, you can ask them too. But if you have a question for me, just hold them and I'll open up the Q&A session when I get back inside. So uh, let's see... Uh, without a live view, I don't really want to bring us to the intermission screen because it's not going to be very interesting. So just bear with me. Um, I will be back in a moment. Maybe actually what I can do is set up... Well, yeah. This is more of an informal stream anyways. So I'm going to move my... Uh, this is not a green screen. This is a poster of the Pillars of Creation or the Eagle Nebula from the Hubble Space Telescope so, on a, a whiteboard. So it works pretty good as a, pretty well as a background. I'm gonna get my jacket on because it's pretty cold outside. You can see our, te our current temperature in the upper right of the screen. All right, and I will be uh, right back with you and maybe just a couple minutes as I adjust these settings here. Oh. 
know I need? I need my flashlight. That would help. Especially going for a bright room to the night sky. <laughs> Oh, let's see. I should have brought the live view up before. There we go. All right, so I did two of the three things I wanted to do. Okay, so I got the live view back on. So this is a live video of the, of the comet. And I turned off the shutter on my camera so that we can test and see if we'll get any vibrations again or if it is an optical issue. Um, so I'm going to take a 30 second exposure here. The reason I did not get Mars in there yet, I did do a quick look around just to see if I could find it quickly. But, uh, yeah, oh yeah, the points out Mars is at zenith. Yeah, we're... My, my scope isn't super happy right now. <laughs> that's, that's the other issue we're going to run into with this. Um, is that it, it is very close to crashing into itself. Um, and so Mars will start, you know, <laughs> start to move a little bit lower in the sky. But it is very high up there. So uh, we're, we're going to have to maneuver around that a little bit. Let's see if we got more pinpoint stars here. Or if it is an optical... <laughs> I know, some, some star shaking here still. So not, not from the shutter, it would appear. Let's try taking a uh, lower exposure. Let's do a 15 second and see what we get out of it. 
And again, we're still getting that weird artifact, and I really wonder what that's what what's what is going on in there. It's been a while since I this is again my personal scope, and it's been a while since I've gone through and uh, done some proper maintenance on it. So that might be where that artifact is coming from. Hey, that's not bad though. That 15 second shot. <laughs> what ISO are we at again? We're somewhere at 8,000. Yeah, not bad. Well, thank you for the $10 donation. Again, any support, uh, be it liking this video, subscribing to our channel, um, and uh, donating using the live chat, uh, that little heart shape, you can donate there, or the PayPal link in the video description. Um, all of those are fantastic ways to support our observatory and science center. And uh, we really do uh, stick around. We're, we're here because of you. Um, and, and that support. So we thank you so much for that. Rebecca uh, asks, uh, artifact possibly stray light reflecting off the dome. Um, there's a chance it might be some kind of reflectance. Um, I just haven't found a good source, um, for where that light would be coming from. And, uh, at least tonight, we are also not in a dome. Um, we are uh, just outside the, this, actually, this door right here. <laughs> um, I'm remoting directly over a uh, USB wire into my scope. Um, traditionally, um, with our observing live streams, we use the 6-inch telescope. But uh, like I, I said earlier, that one is out of commission at the moment. Um, we are getting it repaired, so it will be back hopefully in this uh, in the springtime. We'll have that scope back in its dome. So tonight I'm using my my eight inch scope. Yeah, um, let's see. Lou says the Celestron AVX mount will not like pointing at Zenith. Yeah, it definitely doesn't <laughs> already. Um, as it, uh, the, the, cause the comet's not too far off from Mars. So it's not super happy and it might be having trouble. Uh, uh, that might be part of the reason why we're getting some trailing in the image, but, uh, let's take another 30. I don't, I won't be able to go above 30 now because I have silent shooting on my camera turned on on my camera. Um, but yeah, if anyone, as we take some more shots of the comet, um, if anyone has any questions, I am happy to answer those. We'll open up a Q&A session. Um, so feel free to post your question in the chat and I'll read it aloud. I'll read your name out too, if you like, and we'll answer those. About the comet, about Mars. Let me get the chat window here. All right. Refresh this page. As questions come in, just to make sure I have the most up to date here. Okay, there's one. Wagon asks, uh, do any of your scopes have Coulter optics? And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not certain. I've never heard any of our optical systems referred to as Coulter. So I don't think so. But if one of our Astro Society members knows uh, better, let me know or let the Wagon loads know in the chat too. Because, um, again, it's not, not one I've heard of. We have uh, 
three dome telescopes. We have our six inch refractor, which is an astrophysics uh, system from a company called Astrophysics. Um, it's an F12 refractor, so it's a super long focal length, something like 1,800 millimeters. And uh, then there's the 14-inch Celestron Edge HD, and then the 20-inch the Rishi Kreishan, which I cannot recall um, the company behind that one. I know our camera system on the the... 20-inch uh, telescope. It is a, an astrograph. It's used for imaging. Um, that one is a Finger Lakes optics camera system, a CCD camera. Uh, oh, we got another $20, $20 donation. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, let's see what that latest frame came through as. Yeah, some of that trailing I'm going to chalk up to my mount here. As Lou mentioned, especially at Zenith, since we're so high up. And again, Mars is not that far off from the comet. The comet is at an altitude of 66, deg uh, yeah, 66 degrees. And Mars is at 67 degrees. So they're really not too far off from each other. Um, yeah, so 66 and 67. You can see just how high up that ecliptic is in the sky, which is actually really good. Um, like, if you're able to get a good capture of Mars and good some good tracking on it and everything, it'd be a good uh, night to image it with... A different camera system. In that case, you'd want to use a much smaller sensor, crop sensor, so that you can get a zoomed-in view of the planet. Um, in my case, my camera is a wide field as we try to capture both of them. So, uh, and again, that's what that's what we're going to have to do here. But yeah, I, I, I think my field of view is about two degrees, the, the one I have to work with tonight. Maybe a little over two degrees. So, these only being... Double check again. Yeah, 67. It's almost, might be a degree and a half off from each other. I should be able to get both of them in at the edges. So we got, we really got to try and, and do that. Um, let me bring up my view. Let's take a few more 30 second shots and then we'll, I'll go out and adjust that field of view and I'll make sure the live feed is up so that you can see me adjust it. You can see where the comet goes, and um, the way the live field works is I, I believe it's about a quarter second um, frame update. So it, it is a video, but every second you have four frames playing out. So it's very low frame rate video compared to you know what you what you're viewing right now on my camera, for instance. Uh, did I miss any questions here? Let's see. Oh, Lou, Lou says, oh, it's Optical Guidance Systems for the 20-inch scope is the company behind that one. Oh, no, I'm sorry to hear that, Linda. Yeah, it's, uh, it's that, um, just that cold weather, that, that transition from possibly warm to cold. Fogged up your binoculars. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, well, hopefully they they undo themselves and uh, you can get maybe give it another go. All right, so Coltzer Optics manufactured Newtonian daubs. Some of them were fairly large at 10 inches or so. Okay, narrowing down what the Coltzer Optics is. 
And um, one thing I, yeah, I do really want to emphasize on our streams is it, it, it is a conversation. There was that little view again, sorry. Um, it is a conversation, you know, that, that we want to, I'm, I'm not going to know everything by any means. Um, and I want, my goal is to really just continue building up our community so that we can engage with you in the chat. There are so many perspectives and so many different knowledge bases out there um, that we can really do a great job of building up a, a community of um, amateur astronomers and uh, or just those that are interested in science in general. Um, so that really is the motivation behind these streams. And uh, we can have a large swath of different experience levels. Um, and I don't let any technical stuff that we talk about on these streams deter you from uh, the science, from the astrophotography, night sky exploration. Uh, we try to cater to all uh, knowledge levels and you all, you, we all have to start somewhere, right? So uh, keep that in mind too. If any of this information is overwhelming, like as I talk about shutter speed or ISO uh, uh, or the, what my equipment is like, um, yeah, just keep in mind that it's we, we do our best to cater to, to everyone. Um, I'm just realizing my timing is getting cut off a bit, so I'm going to try and adjust that. We'll put... There we go. That'll work. Bring that down just a bit so that our time doesn't get cut off weather there. Welcome to the stream, Bill. Glad to have you here. Again, we're viewing a live view from uh, our one of our 8-inch telescopes um, out in the field there. Um, we're viewing this on a uh, Sony a7 III camera set up for that live image in the main window, and we're also getting some shots of the comet, too. Getting, capturing some frames. So here's a 30 second exposure that we just captured. And the next step, what I should really do is narrow down what some of these stars are so that I can do my best to find Mars and get it into the same frame. So let's see what we got near the comet. Make sure we're at current time. All right, so that's a bright star. The brightest star near the comet right now is this one here, Tau. 94 Tau. It looks like it's a double star. Yep, there's a double star. And we can see in our field of view we have a double star there. So a bright star and a dimmer star right next to it. Again, down here is the comet. So my guess is that is tau. Zoom out a bit again. Let's see what else we have. So we have a bit of field rotation going on there. Oh! <laughs> I just figured out what that glare is. But let me see if anyone in the chat knows what that... Let me zoom in. I think. Any guesses as to what this line is? And feel free to post your answer in the, in the chat. Uh, I'll read some of them out. What do you think? We've, we've seen that come up in every image. Oh, why? Why, oh, why is that line, this was taken over an hour ago, this one here. That line's there, over here, all the way to the newest image. Still there. Oh, wait, that's not the newest image. Hang on. 
newest image. Still there. Astronomy Web says the power line. Good guess. I'm not quite set up that, especially from the last stream. Um, the power line would have definitely shown up in the last stream um, if I was taking long exposures like this, because it, at least in some form, um, it, like a diffuse line through. Um, yeah, like a diffuse line through the the image. Um, or pole support line, or satellite tra trail. Um, those are an other good guesses too, but I want to emphasize that this line has been there forever. Um, since I first started taking the images tonight. It has not moved. It's stuck with the comet. Um, we know when we did our, our rotation here, you can see it was over here, but it's, it's just stuck around in the same spot. The only thing that's been changing is the comet's position um, in the, in the, uh, across the stars and across the star field. Rebecca asks, uh, bright star reflection off the field. Uh, you are very close to what I think. Now I don't know for sure, but you're very close to what I think it is. And, uh, if you look at least to my eye, this artifact has a color. Maybe a reddish color? Maybe? A rusty color? Maybe, at least that maybe gives you a, a hint of what I'm thinking of. <laughs> fingerprint, it could, it might be a fingerprint. <laughs> I'm not that, that, that like some kind of optical artifact. I like to think I take better care of my equipment though. So hopefully there's no stray fingerprint on the sensor or the optics of the scope. Part of a spider web. That could be too actually. Um my my although my scope has been in a bag and I unless a spider went in there, you know, when I wasn't looking. Hopefully there's no spider webs in my scope. I didn't see any today. Astronomy Web says from Mars. That is my thinking. I suspect that this glare is coming from Mars. Because, like I said, you know, I notice like there's this little bit of a hint of a color in it. Mars is noticeably orange, rusty, or red, depending on how you look at it. This does seem to have some color to it. And if that's the case, if that's where that glare is coming from, we know where Mars is. <laughs> we know where we need to go. We need to move the field of view. So we need to move the comet up to the top of the field of view. So let's go back to our live view here. I don't know why I just, I should have pointed at that with my mouse. So we need to move the comet. I pointed at it with my hand. When you do in-person presentations and virtual, it gets confusing somewhat, sometimes. <laughs> so I need to move the comet to the top of the field of view to try and get Mars. Now, the other possible issue with that is uh, I might need to rotate my camera to rotate the entire field so that I have the uh, wider part of a sensor to work with potentially giving me more space, right? It actually, it will give me more space to work with as I move the telescope. Um, so uh, that, that, that might be what we're seeing there. So I'm going to go out and keep this, this in mind, right? First, I'm just going to keep the camera where it is. I'm not going to adjust its position. And we're gonna try and move the scope move the comet up in the field of view to try and get Mars in the bottom of the field of view. If that doesn't work, then I'm going to rotate the camera and use the widest part of the sensor and see if we can get it in that way. All right, so let's let's go out. I'm gonna bring the live field, uh, live feed up. Uh-oh, we might have crashed too on top of it all, so I definitely need to get out there. Um, my scope might be hitting the, the tripod. 
So yeah, let me go out and check that out. You can see it's not uh, tracking properly right now. I'll be right back. We're so close, we can get it. Let's try it. All right, so I'm going to be in and out a lot at this point, so I'm going to stay bundled up too on top of it all. Um, because, yeah, we're still not tracking well. I'm going to probably have to, well, I might have to polar align again, check, check how that looks. And because uh, you can see the, the field is moving on us which is not going to be good for ever capturing Mars and... But you know what, let's take a quick... I just wanna see if we just take a 
quick exposure here. Two and a half seconds. What do we get out of that? Whew, it's cold out there. Yeah, you can see these spikes coming off of it. That is where I was suspecting maybe we were catching those here. As a, one of those spikes off of, pardon me, I'm shivering a bit, <laughs> uh, off of Mars. But you can see it's running away on us, and that's because we lost our good tracking. So either polar alignment, it, yeah, it's probably polar alignment. There might be some issue there. So I might have to go repolar align, and that means I line the mount up with the North Star. And that's not going to be a big deal. It shouldn't take too long. And uh, then once I have that, uh, we can try it again on this side of the sky. Um, I might, just for um, uh, good measure, I might do another uh, two-star alignment as well. And that is where you basically build a model of the sky in the telescope's computer so it, it knows what it's looking at. Um, so we'll try that too. Wagon, wagon Loads asks, do you have something like a ball cap visor to block stray light coming in from the side uh, that can be mounted on the end of the scope? In this case, I do not, not with, with this particular uh, scope. Um, it, it, uh, and you, uh, yeah, so you can see right now that there is some uh, car headlights. Um, someone just pulled into the parking lot. So some lights flashed on the optics. Um, but that's, of course, what our domes are ultimately uh, useful for um, not only just keeping the scope covered up when needed, um, so it's just a pre-mounted uh, system, but uh, also for blocking out stray light too. Uh, Someone asks, may I ask where you are? Uh, cold, I checked the description quickly, but yeah, we're, uh, as Astronomy Web mentions, we're in Vestal, New York. Um, and you can see our, um, our, wet, our, our forecast here in the upper window, uh, right at the top, the date and time, and then the, the weather at our location in Vestal, New York. So yeah, it's, uh, it's been pretty chilly. There's a little bit of a breeze to here or there, so um, that's, that's not helping at all. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to probably keep warmed up. Um, all right. So, yeah, like I said, we're going to have to do some recalibration here on the scope. Um, so, so bear with me. We did get that quick view of Mars. And uh, now we're going to work to get both of them in the image, but I have to recalibrate my scope since we had to flip it. It's now on the other side of the mount, which is good. That means that we have uh, some more time to work with there. Um, but uh, yeah, because before it was on the on the other side of the mount. And this is all just because Mars is not ideal for, like, like uh, Lou mentioned earlier, it, it's higher up towards Zenith. So it's not ideal for observing. Um, some systems won't, won't like it that much. In fact, most equatorial mounts don't love looking at Zenith. All right, so, uh, yeah, I wish I had a cam camera pointed out the door here so that you could see what I was doing, and that is the benefit of operating uh, in a dome. But uh, for, for our purposes tonight, I needed a wide field of view, and the two dome telescopes were not going to offer that. And like I said, the 6-inch, that is usually, it's one of our domes. Um, it is... Uh, out for repair at the moment so we can't use that one either that would have been a nice wide field as well um but this this field will work we just have to in the portable rig will work we'll just have to get it recalibrated here so s stick with us um uh I, maybe what i'll do let me set up let me set up a intermission screen with some music for you so you have something to watch and listen to as I go out there and adjust things. Yeah, that'll work.
All right, so what, yeah, what I'm gonna give to you here in the intermission screen, it'll be a live view of the camera, what the camera's seeing, and basically what I'm, where I'm sending the telescope. So you'll probably see the North Star pop up in here when I do polar alignment. And uh, you'll see, what else? North Star. Um, and then I'll have to do a couple of uh, stars to reset the, the alignment in the scope. So there'll be a couple other stars. Not sure what they'll be. It depends on uh, where it is. There are a few bright stars out where we're pointing right now. So it could be things like Capella, for instance. Um, and then once I get that done, we're going to go back to either Mars or the comet and try and hunt that down. Um, and maybe use that glare that we were seeing before to our advantage. Um, so... Let's transition that. I've got some ambient music to, for you to listen to as well. Um, so you can enjoy that as you watch my uh, telescope calibration. I'll see you in just a little bit.
Whew. All right. So I'm back inside and I'm warming up. That is bitter. And again, I apologize if I shiver a bit <laughs> as I warm back up here. And uh, so to give you an idea of what you were seeing as it was calibrating, um, first I had to reset the polar alignment um, because the telescope crashed. Um, it, uh, meaning it actually crashed into itself. It crashed, the telescope crashed into its mount. And a Newtonian's a long telescope. There's a lot of opportunity for that. Um, no, it's, it's not like a, a Schmidt Cassegrain is a shorter tube. So you have some more wiggle room there. Um, with a Newtonian, it's much longer. So uh, in this case, uh, the, the telescope crashed into the mount and it lost its tracking. But now I think we're doing all right. It looks pretty good to me. Uh, this is good, good practice. <laughs> now I'll have no problem doing this in the summertime repeatedly if we need to use this scope again. Um, so uh, you first saw Polaris when I was centering a star, that bright whitish blue star was Polaris, the North Star. And that was me polar aligning. And then I went to uh, a, a star much like ours, Capella. That was one of my um, uh, alignment stars. I did a two-star alignment, so I had to use uh, two stars to make a model of uh, the sky so that I can just go to objects easily. Um, so my first alignment star was Capella. Uh, in the constellation Auriga. Uh, let me show you. I should be showing. It makes a lot more sense to show you in Stellarium here. So North Star points due north. Here it is at the tail end of Ursa Minor or the Little Dipper here. Ursa Minor, by the way, translates to Little Bear. So you polar align to this because as time goes on, the entire sky appears to rotate around the North Star. So if you want to build a, a mount that tracks well here up in the northern hemisphere then you align that mount to the north star and that as long as you do that the north star it'll wiggle a little bit in place here as time goes on it's not perfect perfect uh true north but it uh does a good enough job so uh you can align to that star polaris and then uh, you do, uh, for me, I use some calibration stars. So like I said, I used, not calibration, alignment stars. Calibration stars are a little extra to build the model out. But um, then you go over here and click on Capella. Um, Capella is a star very much like ours. And it's in the constellation of Riga. Um, and that's the next star you saw, the next bright star. And then... The third star that I centered in was Aldebaran in the constellation Taurus the Bull. Remember, we were talking about this as it relates to Mars and the comet. So there, there's Mars, there's the comet, and there's Aldebaran, a nice red star. In fact, the view you're seeing, we saw um, with Mars, that was the last thing I centered, this, this one we have here. That's Mars. It looks very similar in color and brightness to Aldebaran. So don't confuse these two. This is a very red star. This looks like a very red star, but it's a planet. Okay, so we're on uh, Mars right now. So let's take a photo. Let's do another two and a half second. Let's see if my focus is still strong. That's one thing I haven't checked out there yet. Uh, how, are we, how are we doing? Not bad. I think that looks reasonable to me. And let's do... Because remember, we were trying to figure out... Oh, no, we need the viewer. We were trying to figure out what these spikes were coming off near the comet. And we predicted that maybe that spike is coming from the reflect... Just light reflecting from Mars on the, the optics of the telescope. So that might be an indicator for where Mars is as it relates to our comet image here. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a 30-second exposure, much like these ones here, of the comet, and we're going to see what we get out of that, see if those spikes 
grow and if it would make sense for those spikes to have reached all the way to the, the comet before. Uh, let's do 30 second. We're really hunting this down. That's the goal of this stream is to get Mars. Now, by the way, we're not going, our goal is not to capture detail on Mars tonight. Um, with this camera's field of view, you really won't be doing that. Um, it's really just to get, to see the comet um, and Mars in the same field of view. So let's do a 30 second exposure of this one here. Yeah, it's taking it. Um, so yeah, we're looking at Mars now. So here's Mars and Stellarium. Mars for us in New York is in, oh, this is not the current time. This is the current time. Um, so here's where's Mars currently in the Western sky, moving towards setting, but it's still really high up and it's got some time to go before it will set. Let's see when Mars sets. Bring the clock up. Go hour by hour. Mars will set maybe around 2.30 or so, looks like. 2.30 in the morning. I do not intend to keep this stream going until then. <laughs> I do need to get some, some sleep tonight. And we started early as well, so we'll see what we can do. But uh, let's see what that frame looks like. Looks like it's ready. Oh, looks like we captured a satellite too. Maybe, maybe a satellite. Yeah, there's no fringing on either side of it, so my guess is that was a satellite. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty bright. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's uh, the issue we're running into, I think, with those spike patterns. We saw some diffraction going on in the optics of the scope from the glare of Mars. So, uh, let's see. How are we doing with the tracking? Is this... It's not too bad. Those stars are all right. There's still a little bit of bounciness going on, which might just be due to my mount. Um, so now our goal is to try and find where the comet will be and frame this all up so we can get both into view. All right, so let's take a look at Stellarium and compare. Side by side, zoom in on Mars. We're gonna take a look at the stars that are near it, compare it to our field of view. Let's, do, let's use this one. This is gonna be a little bit more accurate for. All right, we might be optimally set up here. Here's the comet, here's Mars, right? And I think, I think, I think, some weird little, wiggle there too. I don't know what that is. Um, see, I see these three bright stars. Those might be what I'm looking for. These three might be these three, because those are three stars that are reasonably right, bright in a row, or in a, almost a line in a curve, I suppose. So if we move the camera towards those, get Mars all the way off to the right-hand side here of the field of view, we might get the comet in the frame. Um, 
so that's what we're gonna we're gonna have to try next I think let's see if it, did this help help give us any better idea we do have a lot of space to work with over here we might also be able to use the diagonal to our advantage as well we'll see about that all right Like I, I said earlier, for anyone just tuning into the stream, we're very much working, like the field of view we're working on right now, it's, it's very much going to be along the edge where we capture both of these together. Um, worst comes to worst, we can just bounce between the two of them. Um, but I do want to try and get both of them in the same field of view. So that's what I'm going to try next. I'm just going to try moving to this grouping of stars here that we I believe that we're seeing there all right so I'm going to bring the live view back up <clears throat> yeah see this shows a triangle here is that what we should be seeing that's what I'm seeing here yeah triangle there Triangle there. My camera is actually showing more stars, I think, than Stellarium is showing, which is part of the problem, but that's okay. Three stars here, triangle there. So we're going to try and go to the left above this here. We'll find a bright star and then maybe the comet if we can get it all in the frame. All right. I'm going to go out and try that. Okay. Let's see what we can do. I'm going to keep the live view up so you can see me and make the adjustments. forget my my uh, lights do I have in my pocket oh no it's right here We got it. Do you see them? Both in the field of view. We were right. Okay. So let's take a lower exposure shot here because 30 seconds is gonna over, I mean, Mars is gonna really blow out the image, I think. Well, let's just start. Small. Increase. There's a four second shot. I'll try that first. All right. 
So there's the comet. And there's Mars. And we're seeing that in the live view right now. Mars down here. Comet over there. All right, now notice the brightness differences between these two. Without doing some processing um, and some kind of image stacking and manipulation, you're really not going to pull detail out of either of these. More than that, Mars is also pretty small in the sky. I would need a crop sensor to really make use of, of some good data. But there they are together. And if we watch this long enough, we would start to see the comet move across the field. It's not going to get very close to Mars. We'll have to see which, which way it's moving after we take some more frames of this view. But, uh, you know, I still, I still think I can even improve this a little bit. Um, but for now, let's work with what we've got, and then we'll play around with some uh, adjustments. All right, so let's bump this up here. Let's try, let's, well, let's just do increase slowly. Let's do a five second next. All right, and as we increase the shutter speed, we're gonna get more and more of that tail and that coma. Oh, I just took another five second, that's okay. You can never have too much data. Right. All right, so that's another five second. Let's try a six second. All right, keep going. Eight second. <clears throat> This is the solar system in action, everyone. It's really cool to see. Especially for a, an object like a comet that moves very quickly even compared to the planets um, through the star field. It'll be neat to eat, compare some of these frames as time goes by. All right, that was a 10 second. You can see some of that tail. But when I like the, I'm glad the tail is positioned the way it is. That's good. All right, keep going. Well, thank you for the $20 donation. And if you would like to donate to Copernic Observatory, you can do so using the heart shape in the chat, in the live chat. Um, that will donate right through the stream. All 100% of the proceeds go to Copernic through the live chat. You can also donate through the PayPal link um, in the video description if you prefer to go through PayPal. Um, so either of those uh, are great ways to support Copernic. Um, if you're not in a position to know to, to donate, you can of course uh, like this video that shows uh, uh, YouTube that you're enjoying this kind of content, and we'll continue to grow our community in that way. And then uh, you can also subscribe to the channel. Um, so click the subscribe button if you want to see more streams like this one. But yeah, here okay. So now you can see the green color really start to come in, and that tail start to show up. Let's keep going. Bump it up a more. 15 seconds. All 
All right, we got our frame. Keep going. 20 seconds. Yeah, that colors that green color is really popping now. We didn't get anything like that on the uh, previous stream. Yeah, you know, I think that fringe line really was coming from. Uh, really was coming from uh, Mars that we were seeing earlier. Let's go back. Maybe not. The tail's pointed this way. Yeah, no, I think it is. Because again, look at this color too. It's very similar to that fringe line. All right, let's keep going. Let's do a 25 second now. All right, I'm finally, you know, I'm not mad at, I mean, this is definitely crazy down here. <laughs> like this, that's a lot of glow and a lot of fringe pattern, but of diffraction fringes, but we can try the, the 30, Let's see what we get. Really the goal is to image the comet and then, oh, hey, there's Mars too <laughs> in the same view. But it's not, it's definitely not, um, preventing us from getting that tail and that green glow. So that's fun. All right. Yep. Now there's that nice green coma. And a little bit of that tail coming out. Compare it to our earlier images of just the comet. Yep, about the same. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. We get them both in the field of view. It's, it's just... A really neat exercise, I think. Um, now, the next thing I want to try is getting enough frames um, to maybe put together, even if it's just a very short video, just to see a little bit of shifting in the comet with Mars. But I would like to uh, play around with a field of view first uh, before we, we start work on that. So... Uh, what did I want to do here? Not she. Um, well, 
I'm going to go out there and adjust the field of view. Oh, I wanted to look at some of the comments here. I wanted to take a moment to answer some questions. So if you have a question, feel free to put them in the chat, and I'll be happy to answer those in the over the next five minutes or so. We'll do a quick Q&A. Um, I saw a question here. We'll start here because I can't go too high up. Um, so if I missed your question, go ahead and put it back in, and I'll get to it. Um, I'm going to start with Wagon's question. Uh, asking, how does the speed of the comet compare to satellites moving across the sky? So if I go to our time lapse from February 1st, we took that like hours of footage that we got from the comet and we turned it into a video, a time lapse that you can watch in a few seconds really. So here's that YouTube short. You can watch this on your phone or on your computer. And this is the comet. This is our footage from that stream the comet moving through the star field. But that was over the couple hours we were getting this imagery. Um, so it's this is not a live real-time view. This is a time lapse. So very, uh, just all that footage put together in a few seconds. So uh, that speed there in this, this time lapse of the comet isn't too far off from what a satellite would look like moving through the star field. They can go even faster than that, though. And this is the speed the comet's going right now in real time. It's not perceptible, right? Um, again, like I said, you gotta put it, you gotta record a bunch of uh, frames or video footage, and then over time you'll be able to see that shift. Um, so yeah, that's our, our goal here is we're going to try and get a little bit of a better view so that we can tr capture, um, the comet moving towards, to well, I don't think it's going to quite move towards Mars. Let's see where it's going to go. Again, we're really making use of all of our tools tonight. Oh, let me turn so you don't have that, uh. So we don't have that audio playing. You might not even be getting it on your end, but I'm going to pause that video. You can go back and, and watch this if you want um, on our YouTube channel. It's a YouTube short. Uh, but let's go to Stellarium and take a look about uh, at where the comet's headed. Oh, it's moving away. It's going to move out of frame, potentially. So, yeah, now's the time. Like, this is... Yeah, at this stage, it's going to just be drifting away from Mars. So, we're going to have to work to get those images now if we want to try this. Oh, yeah, Pat makes a really good point. Pat is a, another member of our Copernic Astronomical Society. Um, and he says it, it is wild how much slower the comet is moving now compared to close approach. And, uh, yeah, it's because if we look at the, the orbital path here. Okay, right? If we go back a week, even let's go back to close approach on the February 1st. The comet was much closer here to the Earth than it is now. See how much further out it is? And that's because both objects have moved in their orbit, right? So they're much further away. And so the, the, that perception of motion through space, just like all the planets, the planets, you won't see Mars, even though it's moving, the day-to-day -day motion of Mars is maybe just slightly noticeable. If you really to you know dig out your ruler and take a couple of frames day to day, um, but it's not very much. It's really like week to week, month to month, where you can really notice that change, and that's because those objects are much further away. Same with the comet. As it drifts further away, it's going to appear to move slower. Um, 
And that's another example of why satellites, uh, someone asked that question about satellites earlier, why satellites uh, take, um, uh, why, why they look like they're moving so fast because, well, one, they are, they're moving really quick, but two, they're also really close to us. So um, it's that perception of motion and uh, yeah, how it's uh, uh, how close it is to the, our our perspective, our viewpoint here on Earth. Um, and yes, just in in most simplest ter of terms, Toyo Toyota, I love your name by the way, um, says all about perspective. Yep, um, and that's what's cool about these solar system objects. Is it's really an opportunity in these comets. It's really an opportunity to. Um, think about space, not as this looking up, you know, looking up at our two, almost 2D perspective on space, but to think about it in 3D. And this motion between objects is a good uh, example of doing that. Um, so, all right, I'm going to go out and adjust the field of view a bit, see if we can frame this up just a, a bit better. And... Uh, We'll, we'll take some more frames and maybe get, if we're here long enough, we'll, we'll maybe try to get some motion out of, out of these objects, okay? I always forget my light. I always put it in the same spot too. I guess that's good. All right, that might be about the best I can do. It's that sort of diagonal view of the two objects there. See how that compares to the previous frames. Yeah, that's about, about where we're gonna be. Okay, so let's take a couple shorter exposures. We'll just do 10 seconds, that'll be fine. All right, yeah, I think I'm happy with that. I mean, with the field of view we have to work with, we can only make this look so pleasing um, to the eye as a picture. We're, be the, we're beholden, I guess, to the nature of these celestial bodies, right? We're stuck with what we have. So uh, let's 
Let's work with that. I like the diagonal view. Um, oh, I don't want to go that way. Let's go the other way. Well, thank you for joining us, uh, Prin. We were we're so happy to have you. When how, for however long you can tune in, and we we'll see you on the uh, next uh, live stream program. The next live stream, by the way, everyone will most likely be um, one of our presentation live streams uh, for Winter Star Party uh, next week, next Saturday. Yeah, that's pretty good. I'm going to go right up to 30 seconds and just see how much more detail we get out of that. If it will make it worth it or not. 30 seconds. Thank you for the donation. Uh, we really appreciate it. Did I miss any donations here? No. I always like to try to announce them as they as they come in, even if it's an anonymous donation. We want to make sure that uh, we show our appreciation for it. Yep, we're in we're in Binghamton, New York. Yep, or I the, the uh, suburb of Binghamton, Vestal. If that comment was uh, directed at me, maybe you were answering some other. Question. Yeah, Linda, it's a little bit hazy up here. Not too bad, um, but we're we're getting good images out of this, so that's good. All right, thirty second versus twenty. Is it worth it? I'm not really happy with my star shapes, but Pat, do you have any idea what that could be? I, at first I thought it was a vibration because it looks like a little bit of a shake. Um, so I, I entered silent shooting mode on my camera just to minimize any of the, the shutter, even though that really shouldn't be an issue. But yeah, I'm at a a bit of a loss for what that could be. Maybe it's a just a weird tracking error. I don't know. Well, actually, now that I look in the center of the view, these all look relatively good. What about over here? Hmm. Okay. Yep, I see. I see what's going on now. Uh, oh yeah, so I'm using uh, a uh, I'm using my personal rig because um, the six inch is out of out of commission for the moment. So uh, I got my eight inch newt and the Celestron AVX mount. And my Sony a7 III camera is what I'm using tonight. I'm trying to decide between the 30 
and a 20. What are the star shapes on the 20? I told you to ask, what does Copernic mean? Yeah, um, people are right uh, as they reply to you here. Um, it is, uh, our namesake is uh, Nicholas Copernicus, or in Polish, Mikolaj Copernic. And uh, he's the father of modern astronomy, as we call him. He's the one that proved that the, uh, uh, the heliocentric model of the solar system, so the sun is at the center instead of the uh, geocentric, which means Earth is at the center. Okay, so Pat says, could be two things, uh, could be lens uh, too fast of an f-stop, or you need to load your mount balance to a tad to the east. I may not have done that tonight, um, so I'll try those out for next time and see if I can correct those. Because, yeah, it def definitely does seem on the edges. That's where I'm getting the, the worst of it. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll try correcting those. Oh, well, thanks for uh, joining us tonight, Rebecca. And yeah, we'll see you then. Yeah. Yep. Same. That's, that's, uh, it's just that we use the Polish version of his name, Toyota. So, it, and because we're we were founded by the Polish Society of Room County, um, so we use the Polish pronunciation of of Nicholas Copernicus, which is Nikolai Copernic. I know you. Yeah, I remember you mentioning load load to the east, um, and I think. Yeah, no. Tonight I'm loaded to the. If I remember setting up, I'm loaded to the west. So, uh, I think that must be what it is. I do need to try getting my rig set up with some guiding as well. Um, I have I have not done that yet. I've just toyed around with guiding so far, so that's a, another uh, step to take. Zach says. I've really been enjoying seeing the contrast and brightness between the comet and Mars. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, pretty neat. You know, this is magnitude in action, right? So Mars, according to Stellarium, is magnitude, basically magnitude zero. So right in the center of that scale, about the same brightness as the star, the bright star Vega. And the comet, according to Stellarium, is a 6.6. .6. How accurate that is, hard to say, but based on what we're seeing in the camera view, that's, that seems to be about right. Definitely dimmer than a six. Um, and yeah, to see the, the contrast play out between these two, um, that's uh, that's the the, the the trick with this, <laughs> is that yeah, you're dealing with some uh, a vastly brighter object uh, for Mars. But you can see yeah that nucleus. In the, in the comet is pretty bright when you do a long exposure. And that green color is really popping out now. And I think that tail too, that fanned out tail, not too bad there. All right. Oh, a field flattener, right. Yeah, I mean, that's what it, it seems to be. I'm pretty pleased with the, the look of it um, at center. Let's see if, if I go back to one of my earlier pictures. Is it the same thing at the center? Are these sharp here? Uh, not bad. 
head. What about on the edges? Yeah, again, much worse on the edges. Yep. A little bit of dust bunnies here, too. I'll have to see where those are coming from. All right. Well, that, some good notes. Some things to try out. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty happy with the where how the tail's coming in, so let's keep going with a few more frames. Yeah, I don't know what I see the comments about um it being so it is even though it says it's uh what is it now? It's 20, temperature's dropping. It is 26 degrees. Um, earlier it was 28, you know, around 30. But even then, it was just, it just felt bitter. It was a really bitter cold. I shouldn't be, I should be taking notes, Pat. <laughs> um, but the good thing is this records the... the the uh, live chat records too, but I mean I can't remember a field field flattener. I will look in, into getting one of those, um, especially as I really start to use my rig more. This is a, I think this is the first time I've broken it out in the winter time. Um, oop, oop, sorry about that. Yeah, that's something. Oh, I should I should stack too. I should think about stacking some of these frames. I'll do some things in some quick frames. Well, I guess that's the nice thing about it not moving on us too much is that I'll be, you know, compared to the February 1st one where that was more of an issue, though not even then, not too bad. Um, let's see how that frame come out. Yeah, that's nice. All right. Uh, let's take some more. Aha, uh -huh, there we go again. There's another frame. Looking good. Toyota asks, so will the green comet ever return, and if so, when? So the current projections are that this uh, long orbit comet, it's no longer a closed orbit. Upon entering the solar system, uh, its uh, orbit, its, yeah, its trajectory was perturbed by Jupiter. Jupiter is a very massive object in the solar system, Corros controls a lot of these smaller objects out there, and um, as this one entered, uh, that was enough to shift it, give it some more speed so that it can basically escape the solar system. And that's the uh, what what's potentially going to happen. Um, I haven't heard the you know gotten the latest updates of that, but that that's the most recent thing I've heard is that it's an open orbit. It whipped around the sun, and now it's on its way out into interstellar space. And it'll take time to get there, obviously. But, um, but the before that, it was a closed orbit, and the last time it visited 
the solar system, the inner solar system, was 50,000 years ago. So this comet was on a huge, long orbit. So again, for anyone just uh, tuning into the stream tonight, um, I want to show you we have Mars down here in our live view, and we have the comet, comet C2022E3ZTF up here on the other side. And uh, so this is the same uh, set of equipment. It's all being captured in the same camera, um, in the same telescope, um, all in one field of view. So pretty neat uh, to have these solar system objects. You're seeing them in action here, even though they're really not moving. <laughs> well, the comet, if you watched it long enough, you will definitely see some motion there. Uh, let's go back. Oh, yeah. Okay. See this? That's actually more than I thought over the time we've been observing this so far. All right, when I, I'm zoomed in here in this grouping of stars and on the comet, we're going to go back. When was this photo taken? Well, well, let me do that. Yeah, there we go. Uh, that photo, my timestamp is off. I don't think I adjusted my the clock in my camera, but um, that's okay. It was taken at 9.59 p.m., this one here. Is that right? That doesn't seem right. I thought I just took that one. Yeah, it's 10.09. Well, anyways, I'll, we're going to go back to our first frame that we captured. See how much it moved? Let's try that again, maybe with one with a similar brightness. Like this one, ready? See that shift? We're at the eye doctor, right? You gotta say one or two. Look at this triangle of stars right here. Use that as reference. Okay, so this was the older picture. Here's the latest one. Much closer, right, to that grouping of stars. Okay, so the comet is, is moving. Oh, well, thank you, Casey. We're happy. We're, well, thank you for tuning in. We wouldn't be here without you. Whoops. I should really set up my interferometer at this point and just take a whole bunch of images and maybe we can turn them into a very brief movie. The only trouble with that is we won't have much of a live view, but we can watch the frames come in. So, oh, this is interesting. I didn't know there was a new Q&A option added to the live chat. That's pretty cool. I'll have to test that feature out sometime. That's new. Answer viewer questions live. Cool. Uh, start a poll. Don't want to do that. 
Well, I think I'm just going to go ahead and, and try and get that set up here. Um, all right. Now, when I do this, I, we're going to lose the live view, um, but we'll be able to watch the frames come in. This is how we're going to start to wind down the stream a bit. We'll, we'll still be streaming for a while, but um, this is the last phase of, of the stream. So I've gotten a lot of good frames to work with. Now I just want to maybe make a short video. Let's see. I need to... Let's see if this will work right. Oh, thank you for the donation. Again, any any you, there are multiple ways to support Copernic uh, on our YouTube channel and beyond too. Um, but on our YouTube channel, you can click the heart in the live chat, and that will let you donate right through uh, the the live chat here, and it'll pop up just like you see there. Um, you can also um, you can also, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. You can also donate through the link in the video description, the PayPal link, if you prefer to go through PayPal. All those proceeds go to Copernic, by the way. There's no, um, you know, through YouTube fundraising, there's no cuts taken from uh, YouTube. Uh, it's, it's designed for nonprofits, so uh, they, they give us all the proceeds. Uh, so just so you know, None of it goes to YouTube or Google um, in this case. Um, and what else? Uh, oh, and if you're if you're not in a position to donate, you can show your support by liking this video. You know, click the thumbs up button, and you can also uh, subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying the content. Um, you'll be kept up to date about the latest astronomical events and um, some of the latest news in astronomy. And even beyond, because we do uh, branch out into all fields of STEAM. That's science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, so those are mostly through our Friday Night Live programs. <clears throat> our next presentations will be on... Uh, let's see, is this working? Yeah, the frames are coming in. Let's zoom out and watch them come in. Uh, yeah, okay. I think this is working how I want it to. And I'll just stop it when I feel we've gotten enough data. So, uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, we are thinking we are working on and finalizing a new way that you can support Copernic and get something out of it as well. Um, so stay tuned for that announcement. We're just waking, waiting on one administrative thing on their end, um, not, not on ours um, in the end. <laughs> but um, so, well, we can look, you can look forward to that uh, coming up. My hope is that it, we're able to get it out in the spring. Um, and it will be integrated right into our YouTube channel, and it'll also be accessible through the web as well. I'm not going to tell you quite what it is yet. We'll save that for another day. <laughs> uh, Pat is asking, who made it up to Copernic tonight? Um, so from what I know, it was, I, I know Joe made it up, and I think Sasha did as well. But those are the only people I know about. I'm not sure if we had any public either. I didn't see any. Oh, no. Uh, Joe said there was someone um, that, that did come up for a little bit. Let's see here. 
Oops. I knocked something over. I'm gonna forget that. I'm just gonna take my gloves off. I don't, I'm warm, warm, I've warmed up enough at this point. Someone asked, I had to look this up. Someone asked. Oh, and someone beat me to it. <laughs> um, so uh, Cloud asked, uh, how far away is Binghamton from Richfield Springs? And Richfield Springs, I don't think, is a place I've visited directly myself. I see it's near Utica and Cooperstown, which I've, I've been to those places, but... Um, so maybe I've passed through Richfield Springs before. Uh, and it, yeah, like W says, uh, it's about an hour 40. Yep, that's what I'm seeing too. About an hour 40 minutes from each other. Um, so let me grab this thing I dropped, just so I don't forget it, because I am likely to if I just leave it there. Let's see, are our frames still coming through properly? Latest one, Am I not getting another image? What's going on here? Why is it not taking any more frames? It just stopped after. Why is that? Let me see what's going on here. Uh oh, something broken. Did it take one more frame? Nope. Something broke. What is going on?
Uh, some weird file issue going on here. See if that did the trick. Bear with me here. I'm trying to get my intervalometer set up. Let's just see if that worked. Oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Print streamer. I must have saved that file in the wrong spot. Really weird, evidently. Well, let's just try it again. Don't want it there. Let's put it in. Let's put it in desktop. Okay, try again here. spell command right oh.
Where could all my, my photos go? I'm not sure what's going on here. Something broke down for me. Uh, sometimes this app, not ideal. All those pictures are still there. Oh, that's good. They're in my file system, that's all I care about. And double checking this one. That one's good. Good. Let's try. That'll work. There we go. All right, now we're in business. I'm happy with what it's doing now. So I'm gonna move. I d the trouble is I don't think we'll be able to see the, the frames that it's grabbing as they come in because they didn't populate live as I was seeing them here. So there might not be much to see from here on out. I may just let this run and uh, Let's just bring up an example of one of the images here that we captured. And um, we can chat a little bit about that. I can answer any questions that you may have left. And then maybe we'll think about closing out the stream. And I'll, I'll follow up with you about these frames that we're capturing now. Um, if we do get a little small movie, it'll show up on YouTube. That's my plan. Um, and uh, then we can uh, chat about that the next time we're on a Night Sky Live. A little bit more of an informal stream, an informal imaging stream tonight, but I think it's good to have those. Give you a variety of content on the Copernic YouTube channel.
<laughs> Thanks, Joe. Um, I, I am I'm glad I am able to retreat inside and you know live stream over in, in the comfort of the space science lab for sure because um, I think you were the the brave one out there tonight. <laughs> Of course, yeah. Thanks for tuning in, Toyota. Always glad uh, to to have our viewers um, check in on us and enjoy the cosmos together. Uh, Wagon asks, "How long through the year will we be able to see this comet?" Um, I sus I'd suspect for some time. Um, I know that's not very descriptive, but um, at least to some capacity, you'll be able to watch this comet. Um, over the next month. After that, I'm not really sure what will be required to, to observe it. Um, but we'll be able to watch it exit, you know, the inner solar system, past the orbit of Mars and so on. Although, yeah, actually, right now, it's, it's not really moving out that way in the plane of the solar system, right? If we go back to the, um, its path, Right now it's in the plane of the solar system, but now it's on a trajectory. In fact, it'll <laughs> it'll spin itself around to some degree. So it's not even going to go venture out past where Mars is. It's just going to go down and out this way. So here again, here's the plane of the solar system. And exiting out that way so you can see it's not it's not like it flew by the earth and then now it's flying by mars it, when we when it was closest to us it was above the earth now it's it's entered the plane of the solar system and it will exit the plane of the solar system W asks, uh, if, is there a, a window of time to possibly see this better? Like, should I wait an hour or so or something? Um, I mean, now is if you're, especially if you clear, if you have clear skies, now is a good of time as any. Um, objects are always going to look better when they're higher up in the sky than when they're lower in the sky. So this is pretty high up there still. Um, so that's a good benefit of it. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the optimal time to view this was uh, on February 1st on close approach. But then again, you could argue that the moon was in our way then. So was it really optimal? Um, so even a little bit before or after that, when you didn't have to fight the moon so much, that would have been good too. Um, so tonight is a good example of that. This is This is a pretty nice view of it in the camera. Geraldine says that it's been so fascinating to see it and learn about it. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm so happy you tuned in and uh, that we got to chat about the comet tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. Oh, we might have a new follower. Uh, thanks for tuning in, Carrie. I hope you, you enjoyed tonight's content. And yeah, maybe we'll see you again soon. Wagon loads asked, was the sun the focal point of the arc of the comet's path? I'm not sure where the fo foci, fo I always forget how to pronounce that, foci? Um, where those were um, relative to the, the uh, uh, comet's orbit. So uh, yeah, I, I couldn't, I don't think I can answer that one. If, if someone else in the chat knows, feel free to, to chime in.
Yeah, W, this one's uh, a tough one to to really see with your, your eye. That's the main issue with it. Um, if that's the goal. With binoculars, I think you could still probably manage to find it tonight. Um, and with a telescope for sure. But yeah, that's the, this was a challenging one. A nice, uh, a nice uh, comment for astrophotos though. All right. Ten forty, not too bad. Yeah, I think tonight we had a pretty pretty successful stream. Um, I'm, it was it was definitely one of, like hunting down this this uh, view of Mars in in the comet, but that's I think it's fun to see that process play out. I hope it's fun for you. Um, I'll have to think about how I'm going to structure the uh, chapters of this video. One thing we always do after we after our live stream posts as a replay. I always like to add chapters to it so that you can go back and watch specific parts if you wanted to, or for anyone that missed the stream, they can go to select parts and um, and watch that. And uh, I'll have to think about how I want to break this one. This one's been kind of all over the place, but hopefully in an, in an enjoyable way. Joe says, Sasha and I looked for it and we saw it faintly in 35 millimeter binoculars. Nice. Okay, so it was, was visible. I did not go into the, the 14. Josh asks, the moon will dim the comet or only deep sky objects? The moon will definitely impact the comet, especially its diffuse tail. It'll start to blend in with that glow in the sky. I mean, we're kind of getting that here with the, the haziness um, of our sky right now. But um, yeah, that's the, the trouble with it. Wagon asks, did the comet get closer to the sun than the earth? Let's see it in that orbital path. We can kind of eyeball that. Um, back it up. No, I think it got, yeah, it got closer. Looks, at least according to this, it looks like it got closer to the, to the earth. Yep. Closest point around the sun. A little hard to tell, but I mean, you can see just how close they are here. That's much closer than at any point in the orbital path to the sun. So I did get closer to the Earth. Oh, did Joe go to the 14? <laughs> I see. Yep. Had someone see it in uh, faintly in their 25 by 70 binoculars. Very good. Yeah, I think those make the best streams when we're when we're all learning together and having fun. Yeah, it is a it is a faint comet. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's the struggle. Um, but still, still neat to see. It's it's no Neo Wise or even if you go back to even to the brightest comments, which I have Neo Wise was my the first comment I saw visually. Um, and uh, so that that that's the from my perspective that's the brightest one I've seen, and the most impressive one I've seen. But I know you know things like Hail Hail Bob, for example, those ones were, um, I just hear great stories about them. So, uh, I'm looking forward to that one, maybe, or, or a comment like that one in the future. Um, but uh, this one has been fun to track and monitor and, and image as well. It's, it's, that green color really pops. It's cool to see. All right, any final questions before we wrap up? Like I said, I'm going to keep... Uh, going on these photos. Let's see where we're at. What photo are we on now? Is it going to show me? There we go. Uh, 28 images captured. That's pretty good. And these are 30 second exposures. <laughs> so if there are any final questions, I'll, I'll keep it open for another couple minutes here. And then we'll start to wind down. Uh, Cloud asks, uh, how do astronomers deter determine the orbital period of a comet like this one if it hasn't been seen before in recorded history? Um, so it's it's effectively or, or just un the, un our understanding of orbital mechanics and the equations that are involved there. Um, as long as you're able to track the comet, its speed through the solar system, um, through time, you can map out its trajectory and you can extrapolate the orbital period from that uh, data. So um, that, that's really what it's about. And they noticed as it was coming through the solar system that its trajectory was changing based on, its, on Jupiter's influence on it and uh, the sun's influence on it as well. So uh, now they're able to map out a trajectory of where it's going, where it's headed, and it's not on an elliptical path. It's uh, on, an, uh, I guess, a parabolic path, meaning it's open-ended and it's on its way out of the solar system. All right, well, I think that oh, we have one more here. Oh, say you remember seeing hail -Bop as a kid. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard some amazing things about it. I was a bit, I was, what was I? Like two or three at the time, I think. I was too young to have any recollection of it, but um, I've heard some awesome things. And we have a great picture of it at Copernic as well that we took here. Linda asks, do you still have an image to see? We do not. Um, the screen you're seeing here, it's not giving us um, updated frames. It's just batching them together and it will uh, put, <clears throat> put them into the, the file once it's done. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so... That is a uh, that's what we're working with. Unfortunately, I don't have a latest frame to show you without shutting down the inter interval um, shooting, so I'm going to have to uh, leave you waiting for what we get out of these these frames. But I'll show you the latest one that we did have from our prior. One more time, there's the latest that we had um, from our last uh, available frame. So there's Mars and Comet ZTF. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to our live stream tonight. I had a lot of fun uh, tracking uh, uh, this uh, both the comet and Mars together. 
Um, it, it was uh, took a bit of time and recalibration of the scope and everything, but we got there. And uh, we'll see what uh, this this will be the last stream on Comet ZTF. I'm glad we got one more in, but we're gonna move on from this. Um, there's there's a lot more that we can do. Um, you know, I have wanted to go back and image the Orion Nebula. I thought consider doing that tonight, but I think we'll save it. I'm sure we'll have another opportunity. So, uh, we'll we'll do some imaging on the Orion Nebula. We will uh, f see about some uh, other deep sky objects out there. Maybe do uh, a zoomed in Mars stream so we can actually see if we can spot any detail. It's becoming less and less optimal to observe Mars. Um, so I apologize for not getting a good opposition. Uh, we did try. It was cloudy, though. <laughs> um, but uh, it'll come back around. We'll come back around, really, and catch up to it again um, in a couple of years. <laughs> so we'll have another opportunity then to image the red planet. And we are imaging it now, just not at, in, in detail. Uh, but yeah, stay tuned. We, on February 18th, on that Saturday, a week from today, we will be observing, no, sorry, we, well, yeah, we will be observing not an object, but, uh, Nikolai Copernic's, uh, oh, what is it? I, I forgot it already. Let's go back in here. It is his, oh, yeah, fi that's right, 550th birthday. So that's Nicholas Copernicus's 550th birthday, our namesake, and, uh, we'll have a couple of presentations that we'll be streaming out to you. Um, one on exoplanet research, and another on the Artemis missions. So you can stay tuned for that. We'll be streaming those on YouTube, but you can also, if you're available, um, you can uh, come to Copernic in person and celebrate with us. We will be celebrating with cupcakes. So um, we'll have uh, a nice, uh, we'll sing Make Like Copernic Happy Birthday. And uh, if it's clear, you'll be able to observe um, the planets that are out, Mars, Jupiter, Venus, and uh, the Orion Nebula as well. So you can look forward to the Winter Star Party coming up February 18th at 6 p.m. All right. And if you enjoyed tonight's content, I'll ask uh, once again if you could hit the thumbs up button um, and, and show that you, you enjoyed tonight's content. Um, and also subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, that will keep you up to date. If you're brand new to the channel, we'd love to have you in future streams. You can see we have a great community um, here. Uh, they're very uh, responsive, very uh, respectful too. So you'll, we really do have some good conversations here. They even branch outside of astronomy sometimes. So uh, worth checking in again on uh, any future programs that we cover. All right. Um, so I could talk forever, but I, I think that's because I'm tired. So I'm going to hopefully get some sleep here soon, and I hope everyone else has a good rest of your night, um, no matter where you are. Um, so we'll see you next time, and don't forget to look up and dream big. Have a good night, everyone.